Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this concurrent session on civil war nursing. Some people have debated whether all of these papers actually have to do with civil wars, but um, I think that, guess that can be part of the discussion. What we plan to do is we're going to have four papers, and each paper will be of about 20 minutes duration, with 10 minutes for questions. Um, if the speaker is still speaking after about, at the point of about 20 minutes, I'll probably give them a reminder. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll have some time for questions between the papers. So, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Barbara Manwall, who has supplied a very impressive PhD, a very impressive CV for us. Uh, Barbara won the Lavinia Doc Award for the best book in 2006 for her Unlikely Entrepreneurs, Catholic Sisters and the Hospital Marketplace, 1865 to 1925. She then won the Adelaide Nutting Award for the best journal article in 2009 for her Catholic Sister Nurses in Selma, Alabama, 1940 to 1972. So you can already tell she can write about any era <laughs> and any place. Um, she won the Trustees Council of Penn Women's 25th Anniversary Award for Excellence in Advising. And she is currently the Evan C. Thompson Endowed Term Chair for Excellence in Teaching. So I'd like to welcome a great all-rounder, Barbara Man Wall, who is going to speak on Sister Nurses in the Nigerian Civil War, 1967 to 1970. Thanks, Barbara. I am as you can see, my first writings were on Catholic Sisters in the United States. But now I'm switching foci, and I'm now looking at sister nurses in Africa. So today I really want to focus on the use of missionary documents to uh, these nurses were considered missionaries, and I want to talk about how I'm able to use some of those missionary documents to understand, uh, as a different way of understanding, what kinds of work that nurses do. The Biafra crisis of the Nigerian Civil War in the 1960s was one of the first examples of humanitarian aid by non-government organizations mobilizing in the face of British and international disapproval. The aim of this paper is to pre present a case study of, uh, that documents how Catholic sisters from Ireland worked to reduce the impact of war during this period. And a central theme is how Catholic missionary sisters shifted their understanding of mission during this period of violence and war. Nigeria was the showpiece of Ireland's religious empire. The greatest concentration of Irish missionaries in the entire world was to be found there. In many parts of British Africa, the state never played a large role in health care, and Catholic missionaries were particularly influential in that arena. Highly educated Irish women who worked in Nigeria had a religious calling to evangelize the sick and work in health care. In the process, nuns were critical vehicles for translating not only Christianity, but also biomedical knowledge to African populations. And they did this through their chronicles, diaries, books, pamphlets, and teaching documents. It was very unusual for me to, uh, to think about why would Catholics go to a, why would Irish Catholics go to a British colony? And uh, there was a mutual beneficial association, apparently. Uh, the Irish wanted to convert, and the British needed teachers and nurses who spoke English. And so that's why they went. One of the practical problems with missionary sources is that many of the archives are scattered. Some papers have ended up in universities. And fortunately for me, I found some information on a group called the Irish Holy Rosary Sisters, another congregate, one of the congregations in Nigeria, at Swarthmore University, which is right down the road from Philadelphia, from where I live. It has a large collection on peace movements with many documents on the Nigerian Civil War. And the, another group that I'm looking at is the Medical Missionaries of Mary, and they're from Drogheda, Ireland, and I was able to go to their archives, to, uh, uh, and it's a wonderful archive. Missionary documents are not without limitations. Like all sources, they're composed for specific purposes. Missionaries were responsible both to the Catholic Church and to their European and American donors. And many of their documents, such as monthly missionary periodicals, were published for this audience. So obviously they're talking about successful ventures and religious rhetoric. Sisters represented their missionary activity to the outside world through photographs and magazines published for religious orders, donors, and Catholic mission boards 
back home and through their correspondence to families and to missionary sisters who worked all over the world, and those are the sources that I'm looking at. Today I'm primarily focusing on the medical missionaries of Mary from Ireland. Marie Martin was their foundress. She was a nurse and a midwife. She had gone to Calabar in Nigeria in 1921 as a lay missionary, where she saw multitudes of people without health care. She returned to her home in Ireland, where she found companions who could help her address those needs. And she established the congregation in Nigeria in 1937. The sisters also had hospitals and clinics in Malawi, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya. They had a specific theology of mission, of, a, a specific theology of mission medicine that blended a biomedical model with their own understandings of religion. They were both healthcare professionals and missionaries. These religious communities were founded expressly for international missionary work, and they blended their care of religion and medicine in their global outreach. Now, my larger work examines the Catholic missionaries during the dismantling of empires, the decolonization movement of the 1950s and 1960s, and extending into the, to the independence era, era. I'm starting where Anne Marie Raffrey left off. At this time, sisters were shaped by specific educational, religious, and social milieus. University degree programs had gained popularity for sisters in the 1920s in Ireland, and the 1930s and 40s in the United States, and for the first time, nuns were becoming college educated. And I'm looking at sisters who were physicians, nurses, and midwives. While American sisters had to go to Europe for midwifery training, others could get medical degrees in both the United States and Ireland. Still, nuns had to work under certain religious restrictions. Although there was no prohibition on the practice of nursing, Catholic canon law prohibited sisters who were doctors and midwives from performing surgery or delivering babies. It was not until 1936 that the church lifted this centuries-old ban. While Catholic sisters and priests had gone to Angola and the Congo as early as the 1500s, sisters as midwives and physicians were latecomers to Africa. Their arrival just before World War II was particularly significant. Africans' desire for literacy had increased, and the British government was being pressured to improve social services and educational opportunities with the goal of preparing Africans for eventual self-government. The sisters were ready to intervene. During the colonial pa period, Africa had lost population. The newly, the newly independent governments increased their focus on maternal and infant mortality in order to rejuvenate their countries. Thus, sisters work in healthcare institutions to reduce mortality and prolong human life was not only their goal, but also the aim of governments. Many nuns trained in the male-dominated field of surgery, while others became obstetricians, nurse midwives, pediatricians, or nurses. Their strategies included combining acute care hospitals with community health. For example, in Nigeria, the medical missionaries of Mary started in a central, more densely populated district where they established an acute, acute care medical center, then they established outpatient clinics, and then they opened training schools for African nurses and midwives. And when these African nurses qualified for, uh, for, for their nursing, then they worked in clinics in their own villages. So sisters eventually had a huge network of hospitals, maternity clinics, and dispensaries, even in the bush areas. Nigeria was formed in 1914 when Britain joined the two northern and southern protectorates. That's caused problems ever since, and I won't go into all of that, but that did directly lead to the Civil War. It became a showcase for Irish missionary endeavors when the Irish-born Bishop Joseph Shanahan arrived in Calabar. Calabar is the eastern region. He arrived in 1906 to begin his mission, the Holy Ghost Mission. Within 60 years, that one area would account for over 2 million conversions in the eastern part of the reach of Nigeria. Nigeria received full independence in 1960. The Civil War that began in 1967 was between the eastern region of Nigeria, which was renamed Biafra, and the rest of the country. At that time, 600 expatriate Catholic priests, brothers, and sisters were in the eastern region, and most of these were Irish. 165 of them were nuns. Biafra declared itself an independent state, which the federal military government, the other side of Nigeria, regarded as an act of illegal secession. Thus, the federals fought the war to reunify the country. One million people had fled to the eastern region, 
and by April 1968, Biafrans had flooded into a landlocked enclave entirely surrounded by federal forces who blockaded all the roads. Western nations were unwilling to violate Nigeria's national sovereignty and to channel assistance across the border. Now, the 30-month war ended in 1970 when the revolt collapsed and the Biafrans lost. But during the conflict, the medical missionaries of Mary worked out of their hospitals and clinics in the eastern area. And as I mentioned, they had them all over because of the way that they purposely had established their system. Along with many Irish priests, they made the crucial decision to stay with the Biafran people. Now, as a nurse historian, I'm particularly interested in what happens to hospital and medical care during periods of violence and the strategies nurses and physicians employ. An important document is a diary by Sister Dr. Pauline Dean, a medical missionary of Mary. After receiving her medical education from Liverpool, she joined the Medical Missionaries of Mary and went to Nigeria in 1961. After postgraduate work in pediatrics in the United States, she worked at St. Mary's Hospital in the Rua Akpan. And that is where her diary begins in January 1968, and this was in the Biafran region. She gave eyewitness accounts of aerial bombardments of her hospital, people being killed, roadblocks established by soldiers, and the disease environment in the refugee camps. Indeed, the diary provides a vivid account of the most severe health and nutritional problems of the war's effect. Most of the secular nurses had left the hospital, and priests began assisting the sisters with feedings and the care of babies. On April 3, 1968, Sister Pauline wrote, Father Johnson did well on night duty, leaving everything in ship shape. Father Frawley was heard saying to him last night, quote, be sure you have plenty of nappies before you go, because I ran short last night. <laughs> but these types of light incidents were rare. In the eastern region where military operations were prolonged, f farming could not take place. <coughs> famine, had, famine had reached epic proportions. I don't know if any of you, some of you are not old enough to remember the Biafran War, but I remember it and the pictures of the horrible mm -hmm. pictures of the Kwashior Accords. First time I ever saw what Kwashior Accord was like. And this is what the sisters saw constantly. Although the number may have been exaggerated, one Irish priest reported that more than two million have died as a result of the blockade set up by Nigeria to subdue the secessionists. On April 24th, Sister Pauline reported, to Abba Hospital to try and get blood, but none, saw and smelt a pile of corpses in the street. Two days later, she held a huge clinic and gave instructions to the priests on how to put on sterile gloves. The following day, one of them scrubbed up to help her in the operating room. Then on April 29th, she held, quote, the worst clinic ever, 123 patients. 50% wanted immediate attention. Raced through before going to the refugee camp, through the bush, but we got lost. Eventually we arrived to find 120 waiting, five in cardiac failure, many with malnutrition, quashiorcor, marasmus, gross anemia, TB. Other sisters wrote letters back home to their home societies, detailing their difficulty uh, with their working conditions and the importance of the African sister nurses and doctors, how much they relied on them. Conversion was not a common theme in any of these letters. One strategy the medical mission sisters used was to keep an air raid emergency cupboard and suitcase full of drugs and instruments hidden in their convent. These could be used for emergency operations. It was not unusual for soldiers to take the hospital's drugs. At night, Sister Pauline would go to the hospital in the pitch dark and remove medicine from the pharmacy to put in their trunk so they would have enough to take to the refugee camps. In the midst of the chaos, the sisters continued to deliver babies, perform cesarean sections, care for emergency postpartum hemorrhages and combat wounds, and hold clinics in refugee camps. But they also provided shelter, they cared for orphans, and they helped them get adopted. They worked to distribute clothes and provided sustenance for patients by growing their own food. Sister missionaries bore witness to the Nigerian bombing attacks on their hospitals. On June 26, they held a clinic amidst much shooting from planes flying over them. On June 28, Sister Pauline wrote about another clinic. Just hundreds of patients saw 226 very quickly, nearly all malnutrition, crowded, unruly, and noisy. While the sisters' documents reported the hostilities and the war's effect on their local communities, their records rarely mention the role of external agents in the war. It's a real um, 
disadvantage, I found, with some of these missionary records. So it's difficult to discern from their sources how international politics became involved. So I had to go to other libraries to get a broader picture of the relief work. And again, this is where the Swarthmore documents at their Peace Center really were helpful. They revealed details of an ecumenical airlift that operated in violation of Nigerian airspace and without Nigerian authority. In April 1968, Protestants and Catholics, with financial support from the American Jewish community, formed the Joint Church Aid Group. Protestant church agencies in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Finland also formed an international joint church aid group. Thus, much of the relief materials uh, raised internationally came through these agencies along with the Canadian group, the World Council of Churches, and Oxfam. They began an airlift by defying the federal blockade, often under gunfire, and flew in medicines and food to Biafra, even though the Nigerian government had banned outside aid flights. Now, the International Red Cross was there, and it had an airlift, but it was sanctioned by the government. But the ones to be offered really came from these outline groups, and it was, they, it was really the only remaining lifeline to the outside world for those in the Eastern Enclave. The agencies used a wide stretch of blacktop at a place called Uli Airport as a nighttime landing strip for the supply planes that flew in from neutral sites. The airstrip was bombed periodically, and one International Red Cross plane was shot down with four relief workers killed. Examining documents from these organizations, along with those from the International Red Cross and Caritas, Caritas was the official Catholic relief organization, all of these records enabled me to understand this airlift operation and its global political implications at the local level. Male missionaries ran the relief operations. And they were made, and they're the ones that flew in and, and, and um, helped this, uh, the, the, air, the flights. Many of these were the Irish priests. And they were major sources of news to the outside world. They had watched mutilated refugees fleeing the federal forces. One priest wrote in 1968 that he had a grandstand seat on murder as he viewed 78 dead bodies after a Nigerian airstrike on an eastern Nigerian market area. These factors and the Biafran's perception of the situation led the missionaries to fear genocide. Now, this is all contested, but this is the missionary side. It led them to fear genocide, and they communicated this to their home societies. Some priests went abroad to highlight the situation. Some Irish priests came to the United States. Their writings about starvation caused the international community to focus attention on the conflict. And this started, so what started as a local event in Biafra became internationalized. The Swarthmore archives particularly were important in providing insight into matters of political importance. No Western country, including Ireland, recognized the secessionists. Swarthmore records highlight both Irish and British parliamentary debates. Ireland proclaimed neutrality. Britain did not. Britain was on the Nigerian side. France was on the Biafran side. Of course, they were always in each other's throats a lot anyway. <coughs> but um, Britain supplied arms uh, to the federal side prompting the Irish Bishop Joseph Whelan in Biafra to write in his diary, quote, all we get from the British government are pious, hypocritical platitudes about protecting their commonwealth. One sister wrote her fellow sisters that she was not allowed in certain parts of liberated Nigeria, noting that the bloody British were no doubt gloating over that order. Now, I wonder if this was an, was an American sister because she also stated, God forgive me, but if I ever hear some limey talk about my country's involvement in Vietnam, I'll poke him in the nose. <laughs> so back to my major aim. I wanted to look at missionary ventures. My, my one reason for looking at missionary ventures was to find uh, in the archive sufficient materials to meet my purpose of understanding health care during wartime. Both sisters' archives and others showed important religious encounters on the ground. But they also provided first-person accounts of the impressions of sister nurses and physicians during the war, their activities, and the people they tended. Documents provided accounts of the incidents and character of poverty and how food shortages could be used as instruments of war. And this has become something that we're seeing more and more. Yet without the sisters' archives, I would not have found out about the female nurses and doctors' work. The male missionaries' relief work was much better publicized. We heard all about the airlift. But to find out what was going on the ground with the nurses, that's where these missionary documents were most helpful for me. 
Referring to the men's relief activities, one historian noted that they did not wait for their own country to act. For the first time in history, he noted, these groups bypassed governments and acted on their own, carrying out near clandestine relief operations into the Biafran enclave. But what I'm finding, of course, is that the nurses were involved in all of this, too. Their roles as witnesses of atrocities were vital in making them known to the outside world, and the sisters' writings helped do that, too, because they were writing back home. Sisters' archives show that professionally trained sister nurses, physicians, and midwives were also part of the Biafran population's fight for survival during this international crisis. They did what they were well prepared to do. They had already established medical institutions, organizational structures, and proven methods within their missions that they could call upon during this crisis. Their hospitals serve as a base for refugees, patients, and wounded soldiers. They also were part of a multinational organization with huge resources, that of the Catholic Church, and they were beneficiaries of its personnel as well as its airlift for food and drugs. And as I talked to other people who were doing missionary work even today, I asked them, well, what about the Catholics? And they said, well, we don't work with the Catholics. They are so huge, they have their own uh, resources, and that's what I'm seeing even back then. Since the archives contained sisters' testimonies, I was able to get a vivid impression of what it was like for medical and nursing personnel to be surrounded within a war-torn area and the strategies they used to survive, such as hiding a stash of drugs and instruments for emergencies. Furthermore, the existing mission hierarchy seems to have blurred. Sister doctors taught priests how to be nursing assistants. In addition, few sources give insight into the traumatic feelings that missionary doctors and nurses living through these periods experienced, but the sisters' archives do. Obviously, they were frustrated. Because they were staying close to the people, the sisters shared the chaos, the short tempers, the frustrations, and the fears as they risked their own lives. In June 1968, during the peak of the war, Sister Pauline and others at her hospital were encouraged to leave. And she wrote, quote, this is really the first time in religious life that my conscience as a doctor tells me one thing. That message was to stay, but because, but because the people in that area had no doctor. Other hospitals were not admitting women and children, and these were the ones that were most vulnerable to starvation, even as we're seeing in the war time term areas today. Sister Pauline truly saw this as a crisis of conscience. Eventually, the government did force the sisters to evacuate. Yet the long-established networks of the Catholic Church helped provide them succor. As sisters moved from place to place, and they were fleeing the government from place to place, they were able to stay with other religious congregations of women. They were always able to find a convent from some, with some, somewhere for them to stay. Now, in closing, as the notion of transnationalism becomes more important to historians, any idea of international religious ties must keep sisters in mind in their work at the local level. My original question was, what happens to hospital and medical care during periods of violence? I found that sister nurses and doctors found other ways to give care when they could not do so with their usual patterns. They provided not only healing, but also shelter, sustenance, rescue, and help for orphans, while relying on international airlift despite the lack of government approval. Mission was no longer only conversion and medical work. I see this as a very key time for this change in missionary uh, mission. It became a humanitarian venture for their local communities at a critical period. Mission work transformed into relief and immediate aid operations. Those who had gone to Nigeria to share their faith and professional expertise ended up sharing the Biafran's sufferings. Now I have one final word about missionary documents. They were also important in highlighting the impact of conflict and population displacement on health. Nuns wrote to Catholics back in the United States to sensitize, and to Ireland, to sensitize them to conditions and places far away from the experience of most Catholics. They evangelized, and this is what I'm really playing with, but I, I really think this, they evangelized but in this case, they were evangelizing the complacent. Their writings were no longer exotic accounts of faraway places, but rather witnesses to sufferings and oppressions. The Nigerian government saw their work as illegal. The Catholic Church got into trouble because the, the Pope went to Uganda 
to speak about peace, but the Nigerian government saw that as a pro biafran stance, so there was a lot of criticism of the Catholics. So um, they saw, the, the Nigerian government saw most of the Catholics as working with the enemy. And they banned these Irish nurses and doctors and priests. Um, many of them were the medical missionaries of Mary, and they were deported. Some were never able to go back. Some could. Um, and they were invited back. And that's the story of my next work. So thank <laughs> you. Okay, we do have a few minutes for questions. Yes, please. <clears throat> My question is about um, when you talk about how the sisters, how the war transformed their mission from being evangelist to being humanitarian. And I want to ask about further transformation. Was there any evidence of them going beyond just being humanitarian and <coughs> welfare kind of approach? to them actually changing their identity to wanting to be maybe human rights activists at that time. Yes. Again, yes. This is a key period. And the Nigerian Civil War is a time when you start seeing non-government NGOs, which we call now, but this was, some were saying, this is really the first type of example of NGOs coming in. But Vatican II was happening at the same time. For those of you who are Catholic, I wasn't. Uh, Vatican II was a key period in times for, in, of Catholicism because it started emphasizing more human rights, emphasizing working with the cultural, you know, enculturation was a big term, and, you know, and, and getting involved with the cultures on the ground. You know, it's not just that Catholics are the only ones going to heaven anymore. We're working with everyone. Vatican II happened like it ended two, just a few months before the Nigerian Civil War started. I thought that I would see a direct link that the sisters would be saying Vatican II says this and we want to do this. I didn't see any evidence of that. That comes later. And I think it's because the sisters really had not had a chance to talk about Vatican II before they were caught up in this war. But by the 70s, by 1970, yes, they're starting to really talk about all of these changes. And that's when they definitely start focusing more on human rights. And so if you look at any website now of any of these missionary sisters that I'm doing, it's we are working for human rights. We're working for water, for safe water, for, uh, for women's rights. It's, it's very much a human rights mission. So that, uh, that starts really in the 70s. And, but but it, this is all part of that change in mission. And it really is a change. So it's really a, an exciting time to study. I could take one more very quick question, if there is one. Great work. Thank you, Val. Very excited to hear it. I, I think um, I, I just want to talk a little more about the proselytising aspect of it because you start off with a fairly long sweep up into the up from the twenties, I think. They start thirties. Yeah, in the thirties. So, so do you think the proselytising uh, as core to the mission, as opposed to doing good work in the church's name, uh, was?